Hey everyone, Doc T. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Horses Advocate Podcast. This one is going to be a recording about a continuing education presentation that was given to me, or I attended, I should say, uh, this week, a couple of days ago. It's put on by the Florida Veterinary Medical Association, and it featured Dr. Jane and Freddie from Michigan State University, whose talk was on equine metabolic syndrome, basically, uh, PPID, Cushing's disease, et cetera. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what she had to say. And I'm going to share the screen. Now, if you're just listening to me, it's no big deal. I'll explain everything. Don't you worry about that. Uh, but uh, if you're watching this on the video, you'll be able to see what I'm, I'm talking about. So I took notes. Um, you might be able to see in front of me my handwritten notes as I went along, but I basically snapped pictures of the presentation right off the computer, and it's a lot easier sometimes. Uh, I learned a couple of things, which is always important. That's why I attend these things, but I'm always a little disappointed that and you guys know me well enough now, if you've been listening to my podcast, that I tend to think more outside the box and inside the box. In other words, I don't feel siloed in one position. With my experience of horses for so long, I, I see patterns and I'm seeing the same patterns over, over again, which means that over the past uh, 40 some odd years that I've been out there as a veterinarian, um, maybe it's 38 at this point, 39 years, uh, I'm seeing the same things occurring more frequently. And I keep asking myself, why is this happening? And all of you who've been following me know that I keep talking about uh, the way we feed the horses. It seems to be the only thing that's been changing. And it really bothers me that as these veterinarians come along and as these researchers come along, they want to uh, stay within their um, paddock fences, I guess is the best way I want to put it. The common expression is to be siloed. Uh, but I like um, watching these people stay in their paddock and never drift off to some, someplace else. Uh, and what I mean by that is here's a slide that talks about the common clinical signs of, signs of PPID. Just to remind you, PPID stands for pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, which means that there's this pea-sized literally the size of a, a regular garden pea, a uh, organ that's at the base of the skull, both in you and in your uh, horse, um, that is so important in sending out signals to the rest of your body through the hormone system or what we call the endocrine system to cause certain organs to produce or not to produce certain chemicals, and that's all based on a feedback mechanism. It's just like the thermostat. It's getting too cold in this room. We turn the thermostat up, and we get more heat, and then it gets too hot. We turn the thermostat down, and there's not as much heat produced, and we start to cool off. So the same idea goes on in these feedback mechanisms, these feedback loops. So that's what's happening in the pituitary. If you've listened to my podcast and my seminars and my discussions on what Cushing's disease is, I realize, or at least I try to explain that Cushing's is just by definition, an increased amount of cortisol above what the body needs. And that's called Cushing's disease. And why that's happening could be uh, either a direct cause or an indirect cause. And in the case of equine Cushing's disease, it's an indirect cause because something's happening with a signaling between one part of the brain called the hypothalamus and the other part of the brain called the pituitary. And it doesn't get all the signals. It doesn't get all the information. But true to form on this slide, there are clinical signs of PPID, which I guess it's right for calling it PPID, pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, but they also call it equine Cushing's disease. And that's where I take a little bit of uh, time to say that's not true. 
The number one sign, at least in the order that they put them up here, is hypertrichosis, which just means lots of hair. But as far as I'm concerned, it's not hypertrichosis and lots of hair. It's the inability for the horse to lose that hair in the springtime. And that's what separates it. And I keep seeing and hearing all my clients say, oh, my horse's hair coat is really thick this winter. It's really getting, he must have Cushing's disease. I keep saying, no, that's really not the sign of Cushing's or PPID. Uh, they're supposed to be gaining a lot of hair coat and your horse is now older and it's inflamed and it's just, it's going to have a thick hair coat. Talk to me in March and April when we have increasing daylight here in the Northern hemisphere. And of course, in the Southern hemisphere, it's going to be different, uh, 180 degree opposite. But at that point, you need to talk to me about uh, the hair coat. Is it being shed? And if it's not being shed, that is a sign that the pituitary is not working correctly. The second thing they have up here is muscle wasting. Now, all of you know that my thoughts on muscle wasting is simple. Muscle wasting is chronic protein deficiency, and the horse is now consuming more of the proteins than they are, um, than they're not, pardon me, they are consuming more of the proteins that they're cons consuming. When I, okay, let me rephrase that. That's not the right word. The body is starting to chew up their own proteins. They're starting to auto digest them and turn them into sugar because even though they're being fed a lot of sugar, they now have insulin resistance, which is not allowing that sugar to be used. And it's going over to the liver and being converted into fat and being stored as fat. So as the horse becomes more fat, more body fat, there's less glucose available to keep the brain alive and do the other things that glucose does in the body. And the brain instructs the protein to make more um, glucose out of amino acids, which is basically what muscles are. And so over time, you start to get the muscle wasting, especially in the top line, and then you get it also on the masseter muscles. And of course, the abdominal muscles, and that's where you get that big hay belly in these horses. So muscle wasting is not a sign of Cushing's, it's a sign of equine metabolic syndrome and chronic protein deficiency, but they put it in here as one of the signs. The third is chronic laminitis. And this just floors me because chronic laminitis or any laminitis is associated with insulin resistance in horses. It's pretty uh, well correlated but insulin resistance has nothing to do with PPID. They do go hand in hand, but PPID has nothing to do with insulin resistance. That's all about metabolic syndrome, sugar, insulin, pancreas, liver. Uh, but the pituitary, the hyper, hypothalamus are not associated, or not involved in that. And that seems to be calling chronic laminitis. In addition, it's also a lack of protein. So the uh, attachments to the coffin bone to the hoof wall is less. So in my opinion, chronic laminitis and muscle wasting is typically chronic protein deficiency, insulin resistance, and feeding too much sugar. The fourth one they say is increased urination. And it's, if you've heard me before talk about this, this is uh, antidiuretic hormone that's being affected by the hypothalamus pituitary axis. And it's not sending out the antidiuretic hormone, which causes the uh, kidney to concentrate the urine. And so they get something called diabetes insipidus, which is completely different than diabetes mellitus, which is the sugar disease. Whenever you say, oh, he's got insulin, he's got diabetes, that's abbreviating and leaving out the word mellitus. Diabetes mellitus means sugar in the urine. Sugar is being released in the urine and it actually tastes sweet. Yes, somebody actually tasted it a long time ago. And that's how they started to figure out that this is all about sugar. And some people call it the sugar disease. But when you have increased urination, that's something called diabetes insipidus, which means antidiuretic hormone isn't working. That is a dysfunction of the pituitary. And I would go along with it as a PPID, but um, it has nothing to do with Cushing's. So uh, again, that's just bothers bothers me. And I'm prone to being bothered by things being repeated over and over again that don't make sense. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five on the list is sweating. And I think what they mean by sweating, well, I don't know what they mean by sweating. Is it too much sweating or is it lack of sweating? 
I don't know. So to me, on this table from Michigan State University or actually Equine Practice Journal, uh, I don't understand what sweating means. So we do know that horses that are on grain and other inflammatory ingredients, they often stop sweating when it gets hot out, when the temperature added to the humidity, the temperature in Fahrenheit added to the percent humidity, just those two numbers, hits 180 and above. So if you have 90 degrees and 90% humidity, that's 180. Uh, then the horse is going to have difficulty sweating and taking horses off of grain has improved that. And then finally, last on the list was abnormal fat deposition. <laughs> this is, I'm like, okay. Um, I, yeah, they're all fat. I mean, again, you cannot get fat deposition unless you're taking more glucose than your body knows what to do with. That is a hallmark. Excess glucose is taken by insulin over the liver and converted into body fat. It's a normal process because the only reason you're going to be having more sugar in your diet than you need is because you have abundant amount of food just before winter comes. And when winter comes, you're not going to have any of that around. So you're going to take the stored energy this in the form of fat, and you're going to draw that fat out over the winter months and use that to stay alive. And you're going to lose body fat and get thin again. That's how it works. But uh, abnormal fat deposition is not PPID. It's normal insulin function, not even dysfunction. That's normal insulin function. And abnormal just means, you know, it's, it's more than expected, I guess. So let's flip through some of these slides. I'm going to go a little bit faster. I don't want to take a lot of time uh, somewhere. Uh, I guess I don't have it anywhere. I'm supposed to figure out how much time I'm spending here, uh, but it's not anything that I can see. So let me just keep hustling along. A couple of these slides I'm going to blow through because they're meaningless. Uh, th like this one is how to diagnose PPID. And this is a nice flow chart that says a horse with history and clinical signs consistent with PPID. Well, already their table doesn't make sense to me. But then they say, if it's equivocal, then you go do it. Uh, thyroid uh, TRH stimulation uh, test, which is uh, thyroid releasing hormone stimulation test. And if it's high positive, treat with pergolide. It's interesting that they use the word um, pergolide. I mean, it's, it's, we don't, they're not saying what pergolide is, but that's an anabolic replacement for the, um, not anabolic, but it's a replacement for um, dopamine, a neurotransmitter. And it's interesting that metabolic syndrome in humans can lead to uh, dopamine dysfunction. So um, if it's a high positive, start treating. If it's normal or equivocal, retest in three to six months. I'll get into that testing in the months in a second. There's another slide that does that. If it's moderate or advanced PPID, then they say take a resting ACTH, that's adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is the hormone the pituitary releases to go off to the adrenals to start pumping out cortisol. And then the cortisol levels are measured by the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus instructs the uh, pituitary to either make more or make less ACTH. And if it's a high positive, put them on pergolide. If it's normal or equivocal, then do the TRH stimulation test. And if it's positive, put on, you know, you see all these things. It's all a matter of testing, testing, testing. And this is what bothers me. Um, and this is my own pet peeve about all medicine, human as well as veterinary. Um, they run to the blood tests. They first start off with a history, with clinical signs, okay? But instead of looking at what's causing that and getting down to the root cause and taking care of it, they jump right into, okay, let's start doing blood. Blood tests are gonna give us on this flow chart certain values, and those values are gonna determine whether we treat the horse or don't treat the horse. It's, uh, and then this normal or equivocal, you know? What's equivocal? You know, what's positive? Um, and that's that can be um, a hard target to hit. So here's the typical flow chart that I want to just blow by because to me, it's just so frustrating that nobody's actually helping the horse um, stop having these problems. So uh, this next slide uh, is just talks about ACTH versus TRH stimulation tests. And we don't need to read that. This next one is the interpretation of results and values provide are for laboratories using it, blah, 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 uh, equivocal tests. I, he, this is, I'm going to try to read this to you. If you're just listening to me, that's fine. 
they separate the year, and I assume this is in the northern hemisphere, but they said that non-fall months, which is mid-November to mid-July, that's a huge swing in a lot of things, as far as I'm concerned, that mid-November to mid-July. So mid-November is you're going into winter, winter, and by definition, winter is December 21st. And then you go through January and February, and we're starting to get increasing daylight. So that's March 21st. That's equal amounts of daylight. And then you start going into April, May, June, where the grass is growing, the sugars are high, the, you know, we've got green grass everywhere. We have increased amount of um, laminitis in horses. And to me, that makes all the sense in the world because you're just throwing in more sugar into these horses. So they said that the resting um, uh, for mid-November to mid-July, a resting um, ACTH is going to be 30. It's picograms per ml, but that doesn't matter. Let's just look at the number 30. But compared to uh, the fall months, which is mid-July to mid-November, that's when light's decreasing after June 21st. We're already getting decreasing lights. A lot of plants are going into the more dormant stage, not so much down here near the equator, but maybe up north where you are, uh, near uh, Michigan, New York, Canada, Sweden, whatever. Um, it's going to start getting darker sooner, and you're going to have more of these plants that don't have as much sugar. So now they say that the normal is less than 50. So it's gone from less than 30 to less than 50. Well, that just reflects to me what's going on in the amount of sugar intake. Then they said equivocal in the uh, November to July section, we've got 30 to 50. Now 30 to 50 is a range. Okay. So it's basically somewhere between the normal and the normal for the for the, what they call the fall months, July to November. So, okay. And now they say a positive, if your horse is being tested in the winter from November, mid-November to mid-July, a positive is going to be anything over 50. Whereas if it's July to November, when there's less sugar in the ground, it's going to be greater than 100. So to me, this just proves the fact that we've got to be looking at the amount of sugar going into the horse's mouth. Uh, you can have all these tests and interpret it this way, but if you're not looking at how much sugar is going in the mouth, um, then you're only, I think you're only looking at half the equation. Then they go into Cushing's disease in humans. I'll get back to that in a little bit, so don't feel like I've left you there. Um, I'm, I'm big on just how do you treat this? How do you prevent this from happening in the first place? Um, they did say that it all depends on uh, how thrifty the breed is. And I thought that was kind of interesting. You know, to me, is it a hard keeper, easy keeper? Uh, is it a, a pony that lives on air or a thoroughbred that's um, a tough keeper? And they actually went into that a little bit later. So hang in there. I'll get there. They started talking about Cushing's disease in humans, and they talked about chronic excessive circulating glucocorticoids which is the medication given for COPD or what they call human asthma and autoimmune diseases. They're, they constantly are putting steroids in to try and uh, calm that down. And they found that they got obesity, limb muscle wasting, and hair growth. And then they said the tenocyte proliferation, tenocytes are um, part of the tendons. They're, they're the cells of the tendon and collagen synthesis, they had acute Achilles tendon rupture. The Achilles tendon is the tendon that runs from the very back of your heel up the back of your leg, that little thing that you can grab with your um, fingers right above the heel. Anyway, that's the Achilles tendon. They said they had uh, acute tendon rupture, which I thought was kind of interesting. So she, the, the presenter started to look at uh, degenerative suspensory ligament desmitis or DSLD. Uh, they're considering calling it equine systemic proteoglycan accumulation. I can't even say that. I get all tongue-tied. ESPA. So they're going to be changing the name because uh, when you look at the tissues under the microscope, they're seeing this proteoglycan, which is this substance that's starting to accumulate within the tender fiber, fibrils that's disrupting it and causing the tendon to become weaker and weaker. And it finally just uh, blows. Um, they're finding that this is common in horses with PPID, 
But they also want you to know that it's not just the tendons, but it can also occur in the skin. And uh, I thought that was interesting because uh, the suspensory ligaments, I mean, sus this is what started with the whole thing. Everything's got the suspensory uh, ligament uh, injuries. It's like an epidemic. Every horse that's out there anywhere uh, performing uh, is worried about coming down with a suspensory. And I think everyone thinks that suspensories are coming along because we have a better way to diagnose it with our ultrasounds. Um, and I disagree. I think we've always been able to diagnose suspensory ligaments. If we had really good hands, good trainers always had good hands, and they could feel these tendons getting hot and starting to become sensitive and they back off training. But I don't think anybody's trained to use their hands to feel a horse's legs every day before work and after work. Uh, and now we're relying on these ultrasound machines to see these microscopic lesions occurring and they're diagnosing suspensory ligament that's coming on a little bit earlier. Uh, so granted the equipment's making it earlier, but the problem still lies in the fact that we didn't have DSLD. In, in the 1980s. It just didn't, we never saw um, fetlocks collapse. We looked at suspensory ligaments and said, yep, they break down in, in racehorses, that's for sure. But a suspensory ligament desmitis is pretty rare. You know, they might have twisted an ankle, stepped in a hole or something. But this chronic, insidious onset of the demise of the ligaments and the tendons just wasn't in the textbooks in the 1980s. Uh, so I love sitting in my time machine and looking at that and then ask myself, so why is that? And again, in my opinion, it's chronic protein deficiency brought on by excess glucose that they're uh, consuming in the form of uh, two things, one grains and two um, starchy hays that are fed 24 seven, 365. And the horse never has a chance to switch his mitochondria over from sugar as a fuel source over to fat as a fuel source. And these horses are getting fatter and they're getting fat around the tail head and the nuchal ligament and obesity uh, pockets. And all of a sudden they're diagnosed with PPID, Cushing's disease. And then they say, oh, by the way, your horse also has insulin resistance and he's got a suspensory ligament injury and he needs to be rested for six months in a box stall and hand walked and everything just goes crashing down around you. And that's probably one of the purposes of my existence right now is to get the message out. This is all excess sugar intake, period. And you can do your ultrasounds and you can do your uh, flow charts and blood tests all you want. That's fine. That keeps everybody in business and keeps a pulse, you know, a finger on the pulse of what's going on. I get it. There, it's in, indisputable that all these things are important. But what needs to be done is you need to go in and take the sugar away from these horses. And the sugar is not just in the starch of the grains, it's in the starch of the hay or what they call the non-structural carbohydrates. And you keep feeding this hay 24 seven and you're wondering why the horse can't lose its, its body fat. Well, that's why. And then add on top of that, uh, the fact that you're only feeding one type of grass, you have one type of grass and you pasture one type of grass in your hay. Maybe you'd say, well, I feed too, Timothy alfalfa, but it's still limited in the amount of amino acids that they're getting. So they're getting only a good quality uh, protein, not a high quality protein. So they're not getting all their amino acids. And if they're not getting all their amino acids and they're consuming all their amino acids, they're going to get chronic protein deficiency. That's what's leading these horses down the path of suspensory ligaments and DSLD and PPID and all the other acronyms that we're getting. Okay, so it says here on the slide, <laughs> this is kind of funny, uh, diagnose early. Well, duh, I mean, that's true with everything. Uh, I could even say uh, as a bullet point for diagnose early, prevent in the first place. I mean, the best case of laminitis is the one that you prevent. Uh, the best case of colic is the one that you prevent. I mean, this just makes sense. If you don't want uh, lacerations where tendons and skin are shredded, don't put, put up um, barbed wire fences. You know, I mean, just you got to prevent. So aside from that, diagnose early. And then the second thing on the list is pergolide. And then it says muscle atrophy question mark. So I'm not too sure what that means, but then it goes on to mild to moderate DSLD, start with 30 minutes exercise um, every day uh, for eight weeks or every other day, pardon me, for eight weeks and get the heart rate high. And they said up to 170, which is a really high heart rate for a horse. I mean, if a normal horse, horse's heart rate 
is like 42. Um, double that is 84. And double that, you're at 168. Uh, so you're quadrupling the normal resting heart rate, which I think is like insane. But I think what that's doing is it's opening up the backdoor channel to muscle intake of insulin, which is in, uh, pardon me, muscle intake of glucose. Pardon me for that um, mistake. It's insulin independent glucose uptake into the cell. So what you're doing basically is you're chewing up all the glucose and burning it in the mitochondria and getting rid of it. And what that does is that will decrease the insulin, no doubt about it, but it still doesn't convert the mitochondria over to using body fat or triglycerides as fuel. And if that doesn't occur, you're still going to have insulin in there preventing the um, production of uh, or the availability of triglycerides getting into the muscle. And that's not going to help. So yes, in the short term, it's going to help, but it's not doing anything for the lack of um protein. It says here, improve fiber pattern, but I'm not sure if it's improving the fiber pattern or if it's preventing the proteoglycan. I don't know, but the exercise should not just be running someplace, but that should they, you should use the resistance bands and Cavaletti's. Now I know resistance bands in humans is phenomenal. I'm starting to see more and more people use these in horses. If you haven't seen it, you need to look it up, but resistance band training forces the muscles to be used at a higher level. And I think that's kind of cool. It works phenomenally in humans. I do it myself. Um, so, and it's, and it does, it takes the stress of the load off the muscles and it, it as the band extends, it applies more pressure so it can get more um, resistance the more it stretches out. Anyway, they also said regenerative medicine, uh, shockwave, et cetera. And finally, they said dentistry and saddle fit. They said, don't forget these important parts of uh, conditioning your horse, because if you're going to condition them, you want the bit to be right, the teeth to be right, and the saddle to fit right. And I'm like, where is it about the diet? I mean, it's so frustrating here. There's nothing mentioned about a diet. Diet should be number one on the list. I think it's in the next slide or maybe a couple of slides from now, they finally get to it. but. As far as I'm concerned, um, diet's number one. Uh, this next slide basically talks about insulin and glucose regulation. It's a very confusing thing. It's very vague. It uh, was made in 2001, which is 20 years old. And there's a lot more information than we need. I've given you all in previous podcasts, so I'm going to skip over that. Um, then they talk about insulin dysregulation. And in the past, I've said, I don't like the term insulin dysregulation. I like insulin resistance. But this slide kind of explains the difference. Excessive insulin release for the amount of glucose present. So in other words, it's a, a response that's more than it should be. And that would be insulin dysregulation. Insulin resistance, on the other hand, is when insulin does present glucose to a cell uh, to take that glucose in, and the cell refuses that glucose molecule, it's been resisted. So that's called insulin resistance. The opposite of that is insulin sensitivity, where insulin comes and boom, the sugar gets right into the cell. So now I understand the difference between insulin dysregulation, and insulin resistance. But again, no one's talking about why insulin is having a normal, higher than normal level. In humans, and this is in humans, they have found that if you are eating fructose, and fructose is uh, in all fruits, um, fruit juices, uh, any kind of fruit, if you're eating fructose, that is different than glucose. And that fructose is going to be metabolized differently in the cell. And it's going to release more uric acid as a result. So glucose goes in the Krebs cycle, it spins around and constantly is throwing off um, electrons. That's that energy, that spark of energy. And then it recycles back and then throws them off again and recycles back into a cycle of three to two to one to three to two to one phosphorus groups on the adenosine uh, phosphate, ATP to ADP to AMP. And again, if you don't understand that, if this is going too fast, if you're, if you're closing your eyes, rubbing your forehead like I am right now and saying, oh, Jeff, you're going way too fast, that's okay. Understand the principle. Glucose comes into the 
the furnace of the cell called the mitochondria. It produces electrons and it cycles through and keeps producing them. But fructose, on the other hand, in humans, goes into the cycle. Instead of going around and around and around, it goes through the cycle once and spits off something called uric acid. And uric acid starts to inflame the, mito the mitochondria, pardon me, the uh, kidneys, and it messes up the angiotensin system and causes high blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, stop eating fruit, stop drinking orange juice. And it also causes inflammation of the uh, islet cells in the pancreas. So now you have more sugar coming in because glucose is going to uh, be associated with some starch as well. So you have more sugar coming in, but you're not going to have as much insulin being released. So you're having inflammation there. Now, does that go hand in hand with this insulin dysregulation where it says excessive insulin release for the amount of glucose present? Well, it doesn't. It goes in the opposite direction. But it is telling me that some of these horses are turned out on the spring and summer grasses where the fructans, which is the fructose of the plants out there, as the fructans increase and we have more causes of insulin uh, dependent um, laminitis in these horses in the, in the spring grass, we have to be having more of this dysregulation. I don't think it's fully understood exactly what happens. All I know is it may, through the inflammation of the, the um, pancreas, it might actually increase insulin in horses. I don't know. But the point is, it's, it messes up more and more of this insulin resistance somehow. And there's, you can put a big question mark over this whole thing. But um, it, it's just the sugar. You know, it's all about the sugar. And finally, it says uh, you have genetic predisposition. You have obesity, obesity with thrifty genes and breed differences. I'll get into that in a second. And then it also says exacerbating factors. I love that word exacerbating. It means that um, things that make things worse. And it's obesity, high sugar diet, lack of exercises, and other diseases. Well, those other diseases uh, is, is kind of combined. This high sugar diet will lead to lack of exercise. You know, whenever you look at an obese person, it's just, they're just sitting around, they seem lazy. And it turns out that their body's actually slowing their metabolism down to preserve themselves because the more fat you get, and number one on this list is obesity. The obesity is caused by the high sugar diet. Obesity is the storage of glucose as body fat, which is starving the animal at the cell level to maintain life. The, the cell, uh, the, the body slows down. It says, okay, we're not getting enough food here. Even though garbage is coming into the mouth, the tons of grain you're putting in there or the pancakes that you're having when you're fat is, is basically your cells saying, I'm starving here. Nothing's getting into my cells. I have insulin resistance. The glucose is being squandered by the uh, insulin and, and sequestered, I should say, uh, sequestered and placed into the body fat for the future winter that's coming. In addition, the insulin is blocking the fat cell from releasing that fat. So now we don't even have fat coming to our cells. So we don't have fat or sugar and so we're starving. So we're going to take our muscles and we're going to start to auto digest them. And we're going to lose our muscles. We're going to slow down. We're going to become quote fat and lazy because our metabolism is striving to keep ourselves alive. And what do we do? We eat more pancakes or we eat more uh, grain. We eat more sugars and it's perpetuated. And the only way out of this is to stop the sugar from coming in, which causes the pancreas to stop releasing insulin, which causes the insulin resistance to stop. It also releases fat from the fat cells. So you immediately start to lose body fat. The body fat starts going to the cells and the cells say, oh goodness, now we have a more efficient fuel that's gonna burn 20, 20 times better, more efficient than glucose ever did. Now that we have this rest because we have this high octane fuel coming into our bodies, our cells can now clean things up. It can start to chew, chew up all these free radicals that uh, you know everyone's taking vitamin C for. You don't have to just stop eating. You'll clean up your free radicals. And next thing you know, the body is, is healing. It's feeling better. But on the outside, the owner is looking, you know, tearing their hair out. And the eyes are bugging out. Oh my God, he's losing weight. But on a cell level, the horse is actually becoming healthier and healthier. 
and the chances of a breakdown of the suspensory ligaments or any of the tendons or breakdowns anywhere or the uh, lack of muscle, loss of top line, uh, crappy hooves, all that is going further and further away from the horse's life as the horse becomes more fit and more relied on their body fat for their fuel. And they do actually a lot better. And by the way, uh, PPID will go away as many people who have gone on the uh, grain-free diet and added um, soybean meal as a protein source uh, through their uh, help with their veterinarians and testing, they're finding that these horses can uh, be weaned off the pergolide and become more normalized, which I think is great. Uh, although this presenter said, once you're on PPID pergolide, you're there for life. And I strongly disagree. All right, this next cell is the enteroinsular axis in cretins. And you know, that's fine, I get it. Uh, this is from papers from 1999 to 2003. And I think this in cretins may or may not be there, but nobody's talking about them anymore. Um, I, I, it's just basically the release of gut hormones called in cretins are somehow affecting the insulin receipt and glucagon release. And that makes sense. But I think that's one of those steps that, yeah, it's happening, but the result is the same. Uh, in other words, stop feeding sugar. <laughs> Okay, this next cell, um, pardon me, this next slide shows something very interesting that a lot of people have talked about and I've mentioned many times. It shows three columns. They're all very pretty colors from purple, uh, purple, um, then blue, green, then kind of pukey green, then yellow, then orange. And it's kind of hard to see this. So if you're not looking at it, uh, I'll just explain what it is. They have three columns, and on, on one column is a lean horse. The next co middle column is a normal horse, meaning a body condition score, I guess, of five. They don't really actually say. And then they have the obese horse on the right side, and they compare what bacteria are actually in these horses in their guts. Now, I've told you a million times, uh, and I'll just repeat it for those of you who haven't heard it before, but when you put food in your horse's mouth, you are feeding the gut bacteria, and then the gut bacteria make the foods and pass them through to the cells of the body, and that's what feeds the cells. So you feed the gut bacteria, they in turn feed the horse. It's a two-step process. Same with you, by the way. When you're throwing in your taco salad or your ice cream or your Slurpee or your you know, steak or your vegan diet or whatever it is, you're throwing that in and you are affecting what bacteria are growing in your guts. You know this as well as I do. When you eat something that's bad, you end up with diarrhea and cramps and colic, if you will, because the gut bacteria are in revolt. And when you feed them correctly, then everything is working just fine. And what they showed here, and it's really hard to see, but there's basically a ratio of bacteroides to formicules. And we've known this in rats, we know this in humans. And when you start increasing the formicules, you're going to start or the ratio of bacteroides to formicules, you're going to get horses that are going to change their body weight. So keep in mind, if you want to feed sugar, yes, the sugar is not just making the horse fat, but it's also supporting the bacteria that enjoy the process. They love the sugar and they either uh, are very efficient at getting the sugar into the horse's cells or whatever it is, nobody actually knows, but they do know that the ratio of bacteria in there is all the difference. Uh, I will tell you that um, my wife and I uh, took in a horse about a month ago. And this is so interesting because the horse really looked awful. And we decided that we were going to uh, just get its, its nutrition right. I mean, it's so obvious it needed all this stuff. So, um, the horse is here about four weeks and I was on the road and, and my wife says, I can't stand the smell of this horse's manure. I mean, it stinks to high heaven. It is so bad. And it's kind of funny because I go to a lot of farms where I just smell the manure and it's just so putrid and people are this way too. And I said to her, well, don't worry. It's only been three to four weeks. Hang in there. By six weeks, you're going to have the gut micro uh, completely changed around the, inhabitants of the gut microbes 
um, uh, of the gut, the microbes in the gut, the, what they call the gut microbiota, or gut microbiome, um, they're going to start to normalize. And once they start to normalize, the uh, stink that you're going to have will go away. And it wasn't more than three days later, she says, you know what, the, the stink is going away. And the horse is responding, he's feeling brighter, he's more relaxed. You know, all these things are happening to this horse as we get the gut bacteria to reflect what um, they're being fed. And that is so important. Um, as a side note, everyone's concerned about feeding uh, vitamins. And I'm gonna have another podcast about vitamins uh, sometime soon. But all the vitamins are made by the gut bacteria. They are actually producing all the B vitamins. Um, and all the vitamins that the horse needs will be coming in through uh, ground forage and a normal gut bacteria. Adding vitamins is, uh, I think, a fool's errand. Uh, that said, um, we follow this one trainer um, for humans, and um, he's well built. I mean, good grief, he's got muscles coming out everywhere. And I just read one of his posts that said, um, consuming excess vitamins is ridiculous. Uh, you're you're going to be making all the vitamins you need. And I thought that was really good. He's an MD um, and uh, biology uh, freak and also an engineer. Um, and, and he's understanding this. And uh, if you consume more vitamins than you can make, that is a different story. If your horse through genetics is consuming more vitamin E than it can make, that's a different story. If you're racing your horse and you're going flat out and these, these bacteria are like overburdened and the muscles are worked hard, you may have to supplement some vitamins. Um, I get it. Um, the horse doesn't need it if he occasionally just runs full tilt across the fields and then sits around for four or five days. He's going to restore the vitamins. That's how it's supposed to go. But if you're training every day, uh, if you want to add some vitamins, um, that's fine. But for most horses out there, horses aren't worked that hard. They're not pulling cannons over mountains into uh, battles, you know, miles away. They're not taking George Washington from someplace in upstate New York down to Virginia. Uh, how many people do that on their horse? So anyway, that's that story. Um, they want, this one talks about why is obesity and regional adiposity bad? Regional meaning that crusty neck that you have. And here they start going into these things called um, adipokines. And they're saying that uh, the fat cell secretes hormones. And this is nothing new. We've known this for a long time. And it, uh, these hormones actually help to uh, create cytokines. And these cytokines are um, things called uh, interleukin and uh, tissue necrosis factor alpha or TNF alpha. And these cytokines, you might've heard uh, in the COVID um, and pandemic, uh, the cytokine storm, and that's what's killing people. Uh, what happens is the more obese you are, the more fat that your body has, your horse has, the more cytokines that are being released is TNF alpha um, and, and interleukin-6 and, and interleukin-1. And they're coming out there at a higher level, and then you throw a virus in there and just throws you over the edge. So um, they talked about systemic versus regional adiposity uh, in horses, you know, that fat around the tail head or the crusty neck, that's regional. And systemic is just uh, what a lot of people are calling inflammaging, which is an inflammation that's causing aging. And uh, it's, it's a really common term being used now throughout uh, human medicine, functional medicine is inflammation. Um, and it's basically that obesity is, is putting out interleukin uh, one and tissue necrosis factor, P and tissue necrosis factor alpha. And uh, these are causing a lot of damage in our body and causing premature death slash shortening of your lifespan dash shortening of your health span. And we're seeing it in horses. The horses are, are getting sicker and sicker by the day. Okay, so now they're talking about uh, doing an oral sugar test, an insulin tolerance test, and resting insulin concentration. And I've got to admit that the oral sugar test is the one that I enjoyed. And this presenter said it's the best because you take your uh, caro syrup, I think it's here, caro syrup, and you put that in the horse uh, 
after he's been fasted and you take a blood sample at zero minutes, then you put the caro syrup in, then at 60 and 90 minutes, or some people just do it at 75 minutes, and you look for a rise in insulin. And they say, if it's greater than 45, it's a positive. Um, and I think what she was saying later on, she says, actually, we're looking at lower numbers now as being a positive, which I uh, agree with. She also had mentioned something about intracellular fat, which I went over in, a, um, in one of the seminars that I gave to the members of the Horses Advocate, uh, where uh, scientists discussed how we're getting intracellular fat in 20-year-old college students who are sedentary and compared with their uh, contemporaries, at the same college who were active working sports, uh, they didn't have intracellular fat. And it turns out that the triglycerides that are entering into the muscle cells are being converted from triglycerides to diglycerides, which means they're throwing off one free fatty acid. So instead of having three fatty acids, they only have two. And that uh, diglyceride is actually the, the cause of shutting down the GLUT4 transport, which allows uh, sugar to fall into the cell. It closes the door and creates this insulin resistance. And in the meantime, as, as long as there's insulin resistance going on in the cell, you have more and more accumulation of this diglyceride, which is intracellular fat. And I thought that was very fascinating that she also mentioned that, um, although she didn't give a cause, um, I think that's from more recent work. Uh, the insulin <clears throat> sent a threshold evaluation uh, basically says that insulin at 60 minutes should be, here's, um, um, it was almost 23 and uh, uh, sensitivity was like 82. And it basically showing that uh, if you make your cutoff too low, uh, you're going to have, you're gonna be missing a lot of positives. I think that was this uh, basis of what she's saying. So she's lowering what the insulin uh, score should be. So you're including more and more horses that are uh, coming up positive. So you're not getting any of these false negatives. Now this part, if you've stuck with me this long, I wanna talk about metabolic syndrome associated osteoarthritis. And they abbreviate it as METS-OA. Metabolic syndrome um, associated osteoarthritis. And <laughs> I've been saying this for a long time. Um, in humans, they've now found that uh, if you're feeding uh, uh, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids or PUFAs, and those are oils from seeds such as canola, uh, corn, sunflower, flax, um, any other seed that comes from uh, any other oil that comes from a seed, they're polyunsaturated fats and they bind to the uh, lipopolysaccharides. The lipopolysaccharides are the breakdown of bacteria in the gut. And when that happens, these combinations can actually transfer themselves across the gut membrane. They're now finding these combinations inside the joints of horses. It's a form of leaky gut syndrome. They're, uh, pardon me, of humans. They're finding these inside the joints of, of humans which is leading to inflammation inside the joints, osteoarthritis. And uh, here in this side, they're talking about increased lipids, increased glucose, um, decreased vitamin D, uh, increased reactive oxygen species, which is free radicals, increased body uh, metabolism, the waist to hip ratio, which is your number one cause, sign for obesity slash insulin resistance in humans. And this whole slide is, uh, is, regards, uh, is regarding humans here. Uh, decreased lean body mass. So that's not good. Decreased muscle strength. All these things are basically metabolic syndrome. And they're showing that they're showing, they're showing uh, synovial effusion, eroded cartilage, narrow joint space, subchondral bone lesions, thick and joint capsule, osteophyte formation, inflamed synoviums. And these are all painful in the joints. Now, I, I know I just threw a bunch of words out at you, but let me just tell you what we found. In some of the older horses that have gotten off the inflammatory foods, these foods that have um, oils in them, that have glucose in them, and these horses metabolically unfit in all categories, and we take them off of that and give them 
two to four weeks, the, one of the responses I get back from a lot of people is, my horse is now running around the field like a two-year-old. And of course, these horses are 20 to 30 years old and more. I've had a lot of 32, 34-year-old horses that basically were skin and bones. They weren't even obese, but they were uh, so, I, I want to say depressed. And that might not be the right word, but they were just existing. And we took them off all grain. And we made sure that they had uh, abundant hay and we gave them some soybean meal and we added cool stance, which is that shredded coconut, which is a non-inflammatory fa uh, fat source. Remember fat from fruits, such as olives, coconut, and avocados for humans. Those oils are um, monounsaturated uh, fatty acids or MUFAs, and they do uh, really well for joint inflammation. Anyway, people who, who get off the polyunsaturated fats, the seed oils, and people and horses that get off these oils that are in many of these mixed foods that we have, soybean oil being the worst, uh, or the most prevalent, I should say, uh, and get away from the excess sugar, they're running around the field like two-year-olds. That's what I hear from all of them. And yes, these 34-year-old horses finally die. I mean, it's a little bit too late, but they actually die happy, which is made the owners so much happier than to see their horse just waste away and, and fade away and die miserable that they're, they're at least running around and enjoying the, the day, the sun, the weather. So um, what was fascinating about this was again, in humans, they found that there's a higher instance of osteoarthritis in women. Uh, they had um, mostly knee pain uh, as well as hip and hand and temporal mandibular joint pain. And they wanted to know if the BMI was a driving factor. And they did basically concede that is there's a phenotype. There could be a traumatic uh, bone injury from the past um, age. You know, the older you are, the more prevalent this is. But they found this osteoarthritis and they associate it with the gut microbiota not being correct. So they started to get this dysbiosis um, back in order by feeding the right foods, by adding probiotics, prebiotics. Remember, pre prebiotics are foods that feed the hindgut bacteria. Probiotics are bacteria, uh, increasing, increasing exercise, and in some people doing a fecal microbiota transplantation, which is basically you take the feces of a normal horse and you transplant it into the gut of the affected horse or human, and you can stop uh, some of these, these things happening. So you change the gut microbiota. And this is why older horses have a tougher time uh, starting to uh, equilibrate their, their weight because the microbiota are pretty much set in their ways. For a younger horse, you see uh, fascinating uh, improvements, rapid improvements, um, but they change the gut microbes in these humans and it started to get rid of the osteoarthritis. Um, Here's a research article, Growth Patterns, Metabolic Indicators, and Osteoarticular Art, Status in the Lusitano Horse, a Longitudinal Study. And the, the things they found was horses that develop osteochondrosis tended to have lower inter, um, insulin growth factor one and higher insulin and parathyroid hormone concentrations. So again, you have higher insulin because of increased glucose intake. Uh, then there's another saying relationship with skeletal muscle inflammation with obesity and obesity associated hyperinsulinemia in horses. And they saw that TNF alpha, that tissue necrosis factor alpha, uh, less in obese hyperinsulinemic horses. I'm not under sure I understand what that uh, actually means because TNF alpha is being secreted by the obese horses. Uh, and here they're saying it's less obese with hyperinsulinemic horses. Uh, so high insulin in the blood, and it, this just confuses the heck out of me. So I'm not too sure what that means, but people are looking at it. That's the most important uh, thing to find out. So this, um, this presenter worked on a product that had resveratrol. And a lot of people know resveratrol because resveratrol is in red wine, and it became very um, popular uh, Oh, good grief. Um, Matthew Walker. Matthew Walker wrote a book on sleeping. Um, he's a sleep expert. 
And he found that resveratrol is one of these really beneficial uh, polyphenols. And polyphenol is something that is created by plants that helps in multiple ways for our cells to take care of free radicals and decrease inflammation. And uh, polyphenols are, is in coffee, uh, is in curcumin, and is in resveratrol. So this person um, presenting, uh, Dr. Jane Manfredi, helped uh, produce a product that has resveratrol in there. And they said, uh, more riders in the resveratrol treated group indicated performance improvements at four months. Another study found Hawk uh, range of motion improved on a chondroitin sulfate resveratrol supplement. Um, I looked up resveratrol in um, Wikipedia, uh, not that everything in Wikipedia is correct, but they said almost all the studies done was, was with resveratrol and osteoarthritis um, has been proven not to be um, correlated. Um, and I can understand that. But um, this gal was pretty much um, big on it. It's now in a, a product that's listed here on the, on the slide called Insulin Wise by Wiser Concepts to support normal metabolic function in horses and ponies of all ages. And they said feeding a synergistic polyphenol, that would be the resveratrol. It was also curcumin, I think, is in there. I, I can't remember. I don't have that right next to me. An amino acid blend, including leucine. Remember, leucine, um, isoleucine, and valine are the three uh, branch chain amino acids that's important for muscle formation and connective tissue. Anyway, feeding this would decrease insulin responses to an oral sugar test and improve high molecular weight adiponectin concentrations in horses affected with uh, equine metabolic syndrome slash insulin dysregulation. Uh, 15 horses, adult horses previously diagnosed as EMS slash ID. <clears throat> so here's a study that um, Jane is the lead researcher on. And uh, they basically showed that this product would reduce insulin. And I'm all for it. I mean, if you want to decrease insulin, anything that works is fine. If, if you or your horse has some arthritis, I have no problem you adding these polyphenols to help reduce uh, some of the inflammation that's going on. But it must be coupled with decreasing sugar, decreasing insulin all the way around. Uh, it said Rivera resveratrol, there you go, has been shown to decrease lameness and improve insulin sensitivity. Is there a connection? PPID contributes to soft tissue injury and metabolic syndrome, osteoarthritis is reported in humans. So what about EMS slash ID? And like I said, some of these older horses that were stiff and acting old and didn't want to move, once you took away the inflammation and inflammatory ingredients in the gut and started to get the gut microbiome back into order, they start running around like young kids again. So I think their hypothesis is great. And whether you want to add resveratrol or not, or this product, um, Wiser Concepts, insulin wise or not, is completely up to you. Um, I think that if we have some stubborn horses that they want to try this product, I'd have nothing against that. Uh, but you have to be taking away of uh, the insulin. And the only way you can do that is get rid of glucose. And the only way you can do that is decrease sugar uh, in the form of starch entering the horse's mouth, which is usually from all grains, as well as uh, hay. Um, that was a nice uh, study. I just want to go to this because we're running out of time. Uh, so what can we do is the um, title of this slide. It says, identify underlying EMS slash ID issues. Well, I'm not worried about that. I want to identify the underlying causes. And her next bullet point is the first time she mentions diet. She says the diet low in non-structural carbohydrates and less, less than 10%. And then she puts in parentheses, soaked grass hay. Now, I don't know why she says just grass hay versus any hay, but if you soak any hay, you're going to be taking out the simple sugars, the fructans and the starch, but that's redundant because starch to me is glucose. It's just put together in a, in, a, in a chain. But anyway, and then she says, eliminate grains. Well, finally, finally, at the end of the presentation, that should have been at the front. You want to stop this, eliminate grains. If you want to hang up and go away, just eliminate grains, and that'll be great. 
Then she said, careful with ration balancers. And I just was like so happy because I've been saying uh, in my blog called Betrayal that ration balancers are bad. They're evil. They're filled with things that we can't even figure out what they are, like lignin sulfonate. I'll never forget what, what's lignin sulfonate. Well, it controls dust on dirt roads and it's in your ration balancer. So you look at them and apparently someone just did a study. Thank gosh, somebody's out there actually doing studies. And get, I don't know where they're getting the money from, but they've proved that ration balancers can cause a spike in insulin. So if your horse is insulin resistant or is obese or you're trying to lose muscle, don't put it on a ration balancer. It is not good for your horse. And now there's some science behind it. I need to find that study, but I think that's great. They suggested exercise with the resistance bands uh, to build the muscle. And again, no bodybuilder on the face of the planet can build muscle through exercise alone. They all take in extra protein. And you should be aiming for one half to one gram of, of protein per pound of body weight. So if your horse weighs 1,200 pounds, that's 600 to 1,200 grams of protein. And it has to be high quality protein, not low quality protein or, or just medium quality protein. And then she said, maintain joint health. Well, sure, use some Adequan if you want. But what's interesting about Adequan is Adequan is a mucopolysaccharide and they bind to these um, lipopolysaccharides that are bound to oils and they haul them out of there. So they basically are neutralizing the inflammatory products, which I think is really good. So even the oral glucosamines will work because they're going to bind to the inflammatory ingredients in the gut. Uh, but certainly injectables work better. I'm a big fan of Adequan if you've got some osteoarthritis. I know one man who injected himself and he was about 40 years old and he came back. He said, I felt like an 18 year old after that. I'm not advocating you should inject yourself with it, but I think the human medicines are also coming along that's, with that. Uh, these are some things. She's not a big fan of metformin. I agree. Metformin will uh, decrease the amount of uh, sugar uh, created from um, glycerol and from lactate, uh, but it does not affect the uh, formation of glycerol, uh, pardon me, glucose from amino acids. So it, and the amount of, that you give to human is probably way underdosed. And then to extrapolate out to the weight of the horse uh, is probably astronomical. And this is why metformin's just not working in horses. Get rid of the sugar. That is how you take care of it. You don't need to be adding metformin or any of these other drugs on here. Uh, the insulin wise might be able to help uh, decrease insulin response and hopefully decrease a little bit of the sugar with that. So hopefully that'll be that. I'm not a big fan of thyro L. She hates thyro L, this presenter. She said they're, they're starting to see high heart rates. I've always said thyro L is like putting your horse on a cup of coffee or two. Uh, and every horse I ever took a, a thyroid me measurement on was always uh, under normal, just under normal. It's just, that's the way it always is. So I think that's one of those things that you can get away from. All right, that's the last slide. And I'm going to come back to just you seeing me. And oh my gosh, I'm over an hour. Uh, all right, I got to wrap this up. Uh, I just want to bring to you this um, hour and a half long presentation that I attended to about insulin resistance and where the state of the art is. This is what was just presented to me as a veterinarian by a veterinarian. And I think that they're slowly coming around to the idea. I'm just waiting for somebody to say, you know, we don't need drugs and testing. We just need to change their diets. But I don't think anybody's uh, willing to say that right now. Uh, I am. Uh, I have no skin in the game. Uh, I am who I am because I've just seen so many horses and I'd like to see the horses become healthier. Anyway, this is Doc T. Thank you for sticking with me so long. Um, I'm going to just chop it off here. Uh, I'm reading a book called Equine um, Feeding, Horse Feeding and Nutrition or something like that. It's, a, it's an old textbook that was the uh, Bible of so many people. Um, and most of the people in it, uh, I know personally, uh, who wrote their uh, articles. Uh, one was a classmate of mine. She got mentioned in there. Um, and I want to uh, do a podcast on that and talk about um, uh, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and everything else they talk about. So that's coming up. Stay tuned. Uh, please, the cost for uh, staying through this 
and enjoying it is to go out and tell other people, make sure that they understand um, that there's an option out here. Uh, the more you spread the word, uh, the better off uh, all horses are. Uh, be sure to go to your podcast uh, supplier and leave a five-star review or even leave a one-star review. It doesn't matter. Just the fact that you're leaving a review, one or the other, uh, makes a difference in how they read this and popularity. Um, I, I really don't care if I become the most popular, the least popular person out there. I'm just getting what I have in my head out. So it's a refreshing, different point of view, different perspective. And of course, if you want to join the Horses Advocate, uh, just go there, see all the free content. I've updated the topics page. So I've taken all my podcasts and placed them where they're supposed to be. Um, and if you become a member, you can actually uh, get in touch with me and contact me and ask questions and become part of the discussion because uh, that's where I spend my time, thehorsesadvocate.com. Uh, go there, check it out, become a member. I'd appreciate it uh, and tell everybody else about the Horses Advocate podcast. I'd appreciate that too. All right, thanks, bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.